we have to re-examine our national military strategy. We have to back away from this very expansive, Cold War-oriented, enemy-seeking military strategy. We've got to get out of what Madison called uh, going abroad in search of monsters to destroy. That's what we've been doing now for a long time. Secretary Gates is not a reformer. He's run a very slick public relations campaign. And this public relations campaign has been helped along by people in the mainstream media anxious to be supportive and anxious for things to continue, for the status quo to survive. Look at the defense budget. It continues to rise. It is larger than it's ever been. Well, we are spending $250 million a day in Afghanistan. That's a, a rather staggering figure if you stop it. With no end in sight. In fact, if anything, we hear people talk about staying in the place for 10 years. At $250 million a day, that strikes me as ludicrous nonsense, particularly when behind the scenes economists, whether they're on the left or the right, can agree that if we're not already bankrupt, then we're very close to it. I, I find that absurd. The, the second problem with Afghanistan is that we're finding people who, quite frankly, are strategically irrelevant to us. On the one hand, you have the Pashtun tribes. No single member of the Afghan Taliban has ever committed an act of terrorism against the United States and the West. The Afghan Taliban, which is overwhelmingly Pashtun, doesn't leave Afghanistan. They fight on their home turf. That's where they live. There are a total of 43 million of them. Uh, you've got the 11 or 12 million in Afghanistan. Then, of course, you have the other 33, 34 million living in Pakistan. But the border between them is uh, So the Afghan Pashtun, if you will, really aren't the enemy of the United States. They, they have no direct connection to Al-Qaeda, contrary to what's being claimed by many. In fact, they had a falling out with Al-Qaeda. Their, their real purpose, from the standpoint of the Pakistanis who support them and sustain them, is to prevent India from gaining the upper hand in Kabul. In other words, to prevent Afghanistan from becoming an outpost for Indian strategic power and influence. And they'll continue to support the Afghan Taliban as long as necessary to halt and obstruct that. At the same time, we're intervening in this process against the backdrop of this Indo-Pakistani conflict, and we're claiming it has something to do with Al-Qaeda. But we've even had, when General McChrystal was on active duty, admit that there were almost no Al-Qaeda whatsoever in Afghanistan to, to begin with, that there were perhaps 50. And I think National Security Council staff said the same thing. What few Al-Qaeda remain, perhaps two or 300, are in northwest Pakistan. They're isolated, and to be blunt, they're irrelevant because we've had great success with counterterrorism, isolating them from their bank accounts, isolating them from any potential supporters. So when we see attempts to replicate al-Qaeda acts of terrorism, they tend to be independent franchises, not orchestrated by any means from northwest Pakistan. The first point is that what we've done in both Iraq and what we are doing today in Afghanistan is largely We've treated what were really economy force operations very modest operations designed to deal with very few people for a very specific purpose, as though these were operations on the scale of the Second World War, pretending that the enemy or the adversary in the form of Islamist terrorism was far greater and more dangerous than it ever was. In the meantime, the interesting part is that we leave our borders open, our coastal waters undefended, and we still don't have control of immigration, whether it's legal or illegal. So the question is, if, if that's true, then what are we doing? And my answer in Washington is, follow the money. Today, the defense budget is larger than it has ever been. Lots of people went out and voted for President Obama on the assumption that he was going to come in and reduce this defense budget, that he was going to reduce our overseas posture. If we look at Secretary Gates and his actions as Secretary of Defense, the opposite has occurred. This global network of bases and deployed troops, which is a legacy of the Cold War, has actually grown. It's larger than it's ever been. It's costing more than it ever has. So we've got the forces in Northeast Asia, we've got the forces in Europe, we've got forces in Central Asia, we're expanding our presence in Africa. And the Petraeus strategy, which everybody talks about counterinsurgency, but in reality, if you look carefully at counterinsurgency of both Iraq and Afghanistan, it looks like a Trojan horse for more nation building because we're spending $250 million a day in Afghanistan. Now, for your listeners and your audience that have never been to Afghanistan, they're going to have a lot of trouble figuring out how to spend $100 a day in that country. We're spending $250 million a day. And the question is, for what? First of all, where did the people who flew the planes into the buildings come from? Most of them shot me away. Well, they were all Arabs. Most of them Arabs. None of them were Pakistanis. None of them were Pashtun. 
Uh, certainly none of them were members of the Afghan Taliban, as I pointed out earlier. Secondly, where did they train and organize? Largely in Hamburg, Germany. And then they came to the United States legally on student visas and, and through other means. Then they stayed and became illegal, completing their training right here in the United States. Now, the, the real question is, what are you going to do in Afghanistan that is going to help you be successful anywhere in the Western world? The answer is nothing. If you, if you had to pick a place on the planet where you wanted all the terrorists to concentrate and organize and assemble, I think Kandahar is a wonderful place. There's nothing there. It's a dead end. It's an empty desert. There is nothing in the place. And that also, quite frankly, makes it easier to attack them. It makes it easier to track them. When they operate in Berlin, when they operate in London, you've got real problems. And the British intelligence will privately tell you that they fully expect a low-yield nuclear device of some kind to be detonated in London at some point in the future. Because London is so overrun with radical Islamists from Pakistan, India, and the, and the Arab world. Has just watched Mike Nitro Circus and saw the hydroplaning episode. He's going to try it. First of all, if, if Gates bought that argument, we'd, we'd be spending 50% less today on defense than we are. And I'm an advocate for that. I think we need dras to drastically cut defense spending. But what you want to do as you do this is maintain what I call core, critical core capabilities that allow you to address the extreme emergency should it arise. And remember, I'm also a strong advocate for a national military strategy that is not ideological in character. We don't live in an ideological world any longer. Wars, conflicts, disputes in the future are going to revolve largely around minerals, uh, land, uh, people, water. These are the things not, are you a communist, a socialist, a national socialist, a Republican, a Democrat? Those things are, are behind us. And by the way, I think that this clash of civilizations has always been with us in one form or another, but it doesn't necessarily have to define all future conflicts by any stretch of imagination. So if you're willing to do business with the rest of the world, which was the Washington-Hamilton view, then you don't have to spend as much on, on defense because you are not out there creating and cultivating enemies, which I would argue is what we've largely done in the Middle East and what we're doing today in Afghanistan. But you have to maintain core capabilities. Do we need the kind of surface fleet, for instance, today that we've had for decades? The answer is no, we don't. Do we need to maintain 12 carrier battle groups? The answer is no. Do we need to invest very heavily in large numbers of manned aircraft? No. Those things can change, but on the other hand, do we need a very robust attack submarine fleet? The answer is absolutely. That is a critical core capability. You want to be able to strike from high altitude, on short notice, over great distance. Do we want to maintain that capability? Absolutely. How you do that is a different kind of question. Can it be done largely with unmanned aircraft? I think increasingly people are suggesting that it can. So how much manned aircraft versus unmanned aircraft you need in that mix is, is an issue, but do you need to spend billions on something like the Joint Strike Fighter? I think that's open to very serious debate given the pace of technology. When you go to the ground, you want to maintain a, a highly capable, technically sophisticated force that is heavy on mobility, protection, and firepower. You don't need a lot of it, but you need a core force like that, that in the event of an emergency can be deployed somewhere to fight, not alone, but alongside allies, in a conflict which is unavoidable. That, that's very different from Gates saying, well, the future is uh, lots of little fellows running through the jungles, the mountains, and cities with AK-47s and IEDs. Therefore, we're going to spend twice what we've ever spent in the history of the United States to garrison these places, to throw thousands of conventional troops at them, when that's absolutely fundamentally the wrong solution. It's unnecessary. And again, my, my question is, if it's wrong, why are we doing it? Where does the money go? Who profits from that? Because the American taxpayer is not profiting. Is it or is it not your contention that if we aren't careful, 
that our defense spending will be part of spending ourselves into oblivion. Well, I think it's already happened. You know, I mean, I, I was talking to an economist the other day, and I said, when do you think we go over the cliff? He said, we're on our way down now. And so the real question is, when do we hit the ravine at the bottom of the cliff? That's the question. Now, we, look, if you take all the tax revenues that we create every year in the United States, collectively, they will pay for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. That's all. All other federal spending, whether it's for the Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, it comes from printed and borrowed money. Now, my question, and what every American citizen should ask is, is this sustainable? I don't think it is. I mean, some people will say, well, the, the Japanese and the Chinese will continue to lend us money so that we'll buy their stuff without any expectation of ever being repaid. You have to protect your assets in space. The question is, how do you do it? And, and again, the question that nobody ever asks is, how do we do it economically? The, the, the assumption is that there is an inexhaustible quantity of money to spend. I mean, look, we can be very successful in preventing the return of al-Qaeda to Afghanistan by spending very little money and using very little force. That's what we should be doing. Our only interest in Afghanistan is, quote unquote, sanctuary denial. Your interest in space is to prevent other people from destroying or neutralizing your assets. So the question is, how do we do that inexpensively, just as how do we pursue the sanctuary denial mission in Afghanistan at the lowest possible expense to the American taxpayer? We don't ask those questions. We say, how much money can we get? And the large defense contractors have an interest in very large contracts. And the generals on active duty have a very large interest in subsidizing those contracts because they want to retire and work on those boards. It, it's astonishing. I mean, one of the things we were talking about, Secretary Gates, look at this recent mentor program. He called for an investigation. Why are we rehiring three and four star generals who have recently retired at a great expense to the American people, paying them somewhere between a quarter of a million and $500,000 to advise the three and four star generals on active duty? Very legitimate question. It was just announced yesterday that this investigation is over, and essentially Secretary Gates has capitulated and said, well, I guess we can use these mentors. In most cases, these are the people who help create the debacles in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Now we're turning to them for advice. As retired officers, a three-star gets 135,000 a year. A retired four-star gets 145,000. Hundreds of thousands of dollars on top of what they're already being paid. I mean, this is ludicrous. And, it, and what sort of solutions are they embracing? They're embracing solutions that cost the American taxpayer a lot of money. We should be interested in people who come to us with solutions that are economical. We have no interest in pouring billions of dollars into Iraq or Afghanistan or any of these places, especially now, given our economic position at home. Well, the first concern for every American should be prosperity, because economic prosperity is the foundation for military power. We are not a great military power because we had genius generals. We are not a great military power because God necessarily selected us for the role. We are a great military power because of this economic engine that was constructed between the Civil War and World War I, and then expanded as a result of World War II. That engine is in trouble. We've exported much of its manufacturing base overseas. We don't have the skilled labor force that we once had because we haven't trained them, we haven't educated them. We don't have the ability to absorb millions of people into this manufacturing base anymore. So we have to build a new manufacturing base. That should be our number one concern. Prosperity, economic prosperity, about defense, that's number one. Because if that falters, you're lost. If you read Kennedy's decline of uh, the, the great powers, in every case, it's the economic decline that precipitates the military collapse. Military power rests on the foundation of economic power. So that's number one. Number two is then to look at the continental United States. Look at our country. We need to defend it. If you maintain these open borders as we are right now, we are inviting disaster in the future. But my point is, we're not really tracking this. We can't. That doesn't mean the intelligence community isn't doing a good job. We have excellent people in the intelligence community. But to be frank with you, they're dealing with millions and millions and millions of pieces of intelligence trying to sort through these. So we've got to get control of our borders and our coastal borders. And the next thing beyond that is to say, where do we really need to be? overseas. And you have to ask the question, who are your friends? And